There we go. All right, Ron, you are on. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Ron Fister, and I'm going to tell you it's a pleasure to sit in the big man's chair here. So, <laughs> so I'll get that pleasure. But what we're going to talk about is turf, and we're going to deal with uh, the benefits of turf along with the turf types, how to establish the turf uh, of your choice. And we'll deal with it as we go through the slides. And there's going to be a lot of information given to you today. You can jot some down, use them with your friends on some quiz at the at dinner one night, and some can be pretty important that you use for your own measurements at your house. Uh, let's move on to the first slide. If I like to the right arrow. Oh, on the right one. Okay, let's deal with the turf facts for just a moment. A 2,500 square foot lawn that many people have provides enough oxygen a day for a family of four. Now, you're going to see that number come back on one of the last slides and how reality that hits the Atlanta uh, metro area. Turf is uh, one of the great traps and uh, stores uh, carbon which is we're dealing with all the carbon issues today, global warming and, and climate changes. And then uh, it also prevents erosion within the city drainage. And we're gonna show you a picture of with turf and without turf and the, the damage that uh, we deal with on the water that's leaching into our sewer systems. Healthy turf is easy to mow. Unhealthy turf is very difficult to mow. Um, turf does stop the impurities from the water system. So it's a filter system. Uh, from when the water hits, whether it's irrigation or natural rainfall going to the curb, it's a filter filtration system. And this is one I like more than anything. It's a sea of uh, sea of green relieves stress and tension. But uh, for anybody sitting in your house, looking out the window and see a sea of green or driving into a neighborhood or driving down the road, can you imagine uh, without that sea of green what it's like? And if you're not familiar with that, go to the uh, western part of the United States and see no grass along the highway. Also, the blades capture the dew in the morning, which helps that grass to remain healthy through the day, even in a dry period. So the blades are capturing all of that uh, dew that hits. It's a very large industry. Turf industry employs millions of people across the country and within the Atlanta metro. If you don't believe how much impact it has, leave your house at six in the morning to eight in the morning and see how many trucks or maintaining turf within this market. Um, now here's a picture shows on the right hand side, there's turf and it's clear water hitting the street. The left side underneath the shrubbery, there is no turf and a filtration of water eroded and moved into the street. So we got to deal with those impurities. Also look at the, uh, the bark and uh, the mulch that came from the uh, shrub into the street. But on the right side, the turf served as a great filter. It's a great picture we um, got from uh, uh, Griffin. Now let's deal with the types of turf that you have within this area. Not many people will deal with number six, but we're going to deal with it just uh, as we go through. Fescue. Fescue, most people do not want to plant fescue because it's a short live as they see it, but it's not. It's 10 months. If you see fescue in September, you'll maintain fescue without anything until uh, the 1st of July, then the disease will come in. By the end of June, if you treat it with a fungicide in June and July, you'll keep your fescue up until August. So it's 10 months of green. And it's great to have the fescue in, in, in the wintertime in December at Christmas time when you look out the door. Bermuda grass is seven months of green. We always think of it as long because we spend time on it in the summer, but it's really a seven month uh, green. Zoysia grass, as many of you may have, it's eight months of green, and that's about all you're going to get out of it. Sometimes it will last slightly longer than Bermuda grass is first day in green. Centipede is seven months, uh, and it's an okay grass in certain areas. Um, Bahia grass is seven months of green. I generally don't recommend Bahia grass, and we'll deal with that if you have it, and we'll deal with it. Seashore past Pelham, it's nine months. That's new one for most of you. Uh, but if you look at the Brave Stadium, that grass on the Brave Stadium is now seashore past Pelham. 
And if you just understand and look at it, it says, okay, I got fescue. It looks bad this time of the year. I got to reseed it, but you're really getting 10 months of nice, healthy green grass. Now, before we start on, on the question of grass, we must deal with, do you know what your soil is? So we're gonna recommend taking a soil sample. I do recommend six inch probe in that uh, soil. And if, for each sample, it costs $10 with UGA. You can pick up the sample bags at the extension office uh, here in Canton and then turn them in, it's $10 and we'll give you back a full analysis. Now, let's deal with this one before we go to the soil analysis on understanding the turf at, at one inch of water that 625 gallons hits on every thousand square feet of lawn. So if you have a 10,000 square foot lawn, that's uh, 6,250 gallons of water after one inch rainfall. Now, like last week or this week, we may have had two inches. So you're now dealing with 12,000 or uh, uh, 600, you're dealing now with 3,000 gallons of water. Light watering does not uh, connect to water columns. There's water columns in that soil. If you don't connect the water columns, you're not utilizing water. So light sprinkling, we have a problem with that because evaporation and transpiration from the soil, we uh, end up not connecting the water column, utilizing what water is in the soil. Uh, turf requires 1.8 acre feet of water a year. Now you get uh, 40, 48 inches of water here in the Atlanta market. So you can calculate that out into acre feet, but the turf does only require 1.5 acre feet of water. So a lot of the water that uh, we're dealing with here is wasted for the turf. Uh, irrigation or natural rainfall is all natural. It's 1.5 acre feet of water, which means 18 inches of water is required for turf for a 12 month period of time. Uh, lightly watering is wasteful. That word is wasteful when evaporation transpir transpiration is high and the water columns are not connected. And that's when I get wilted turf or unhealthy turf. Then you turn on the irrigation, lightly irrigated, you still never connect the water column. And when you do not connect the water column, you have a problem of using water efficiently in the soil. And then my rule of thumb is this, after a rainfall, keep checking your soil and turn the irrigation on to keep the water column, let's say the water is down uh, below two inches in the soil. You're gonna need enough water to bring that uh, water columns together because adhesion and the root pulling up the water from the base is what's keeping that turf healthy. Not doing that is uh, wasting water again. That's when the water management becomes very important. Now here's what we deal with on the water column. The, the graphs on the right, on the left rather, is after irrigation, you see the blue, the water's going down it will eventually go deeper through capillary forces, pulling the water down. Now, once the water is pulled off, as in the right side, uh, then the water becomes uh, not as efficient for the plant, like the turf. So keep those water columns connected. It may sound crazy, but you can utilize the water with less water being put on your yard. So once sprinkling and a few turns of that irrigation head is not adequate, it's not using water very wisely. Now I do recommend this for some of you who do not have a rain gauge. You can simply put um, like a tuna fish can, which is one inches, one inch deep, put it on your yard, turn the water on. If you're not putting on one inch of water, you could be putting on a half inch. If you're putting on much less than a half inch, you might want to re-challenge your uh, process of using irrigation. I always recommend three quarters to one inch of water each time you turn the irrigation on. Now that's more water than most are used to, the clocks are set not to put that much water on, but you water less. Now we're gonna deal with, uh, from the slides four, we're gonna deal with thousand square feet. Let's talk about a thousand square feet and the assistants behind me will give you a uh, bulletin that calculate thousand square feet. But a yard that's 50 foot wide and 20 foot deep is uh, 1000 square feet. So know how many, square feet you have in your yard, because when you buy fertilizer, that's how you're gonna buy fertilizers. What is my square footage of my lawn? What's my square footage of the front lawn? What's my square footage of the back lawn? If you go to the retailers today, they will sell a bag of fertilizer, in many cases with 5,000 square foot on it or 7,500 square foot on it. And I may have a 10,000 square foot lawn. 
the fertilizer many of them are packing um, is calculated to go on 5,000 square foot, but your, your spreader is not. In many cases, you're putting on way too much fertilizer on your, your turf. Now let's deal with fertilizer calculation for a moment. A 40 pound bag of 1848, which is a common fertilizer. Uh, the number is 1848. The first number is the nitrogen, second number being uh, phosphorus, and the third number being potassium. If you do the calculation, at 40 pounds, you take 40 times 0.18. That's a percentage of nitrogen in a bag. And it says in that bag, in a 40 pound bag, I have 7.2 pounds of actual nitrogen. On the phosphorus, it's 40 times 0.04, which means I have 1.6 pounds of phosphorus per bag. And then the same is true on the potassium, which is the last number, which is your eight. So it's 40 times 0.08 is 3.2 pounds of potassium. Now, as an advisor, what I've always tell people is if you're only putting on 1.6 pounds of phosphorus over, uh, say, 10,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet, it may not be adequate. So you may try to get a fertilizer without that low rate of, of phosphorus. And we're going to talk about that on another label in a moment. So some fertilizer, if you don't have enough adequate to cross, and the soil types are not uh, calling for that low amount, which we're gonna deal with in the next slide, then you just, again, wasted the money on that phosphorus. Therefore, a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, uh, I can put on 7,000 square feet in that 40 pound bag, is what that's saying. So if I wanna put on a thousand, you'll see me talking about it. One, pal one pound of nitrogen per thousand gives me 7,000 square feet in that bag with uh, adequate spreading. Now let's deal with this. If you submit a soil sample, you get this soil sample uh, results back and you can make some analysis from it. Let's deal with extreme right first. It, what it is is lime. Lime is a very critical point. Without the pH being right, you cannot take up the nutrients to the plant. In this particular soil type, the pH uh, look at the underneath the pH, it says 6.1. That's adequate for turf. I generally say 6 to 6.5. 6.1 is adequate, which means that you will not buy lime for that soil. So purchasing lime for the soil, you'll raise the pH slightly, but then again, you get the nutrients out of balance. And so you do not want to raise it. 6.1 is adequate. Leave it alone. Now let's go to the left side. What it's saying is under phosphorus, that your soil has 10 pounds per acre. Now, an acre is 43,560 square feet. So if you have a 10,000, it's a quarter of an acre roughly. And so in a quarter of an acre, you would have two, actually about uh, two pounds of phosphorus on your 10,000 square foot available for the turf. And as you notice, it's below the line. So you need to add phosphorus to bring it above the line. Now, the potassium right next to it has 168 pounds. You're still short of potassium, and this is a long process by itself, so you must bring up the potassium to get the efficiencies in the, in the soil for the turf health. Now, uh, UGA gives you a recommendation for established turf. What they say is incorporate or spread on the top 15 pounds of 10, 10, 10 per thousand square feet. 15 pounds per thousand. And again, if you have uh, 10,000 square feet, you're going to have 150 pounds on 10,000 square feet to get the, to get the adequate uh, level of phosphorus and potassium as required. So UGA gives you all of the recommendations. 10 to 10 is readily available. If you've got a lawn care service, they're doing a little bit different than you, but you could go to a... Uh, uh, say uh, Lowe's or uh, Home Depot or Walmart or any of them and buy a bag of 10, 10, 10 or 12, 12, 12. Remember if it's 12, 12, 12, it's the same as 10, 10, 10. It's just a little more nutrients per bag. So you just cut the rate back to like 12 pounds per thousand square feet. Now for maintenance level, UGA gives you the maintenance. Go down, it says apply 10 pounds of 10, 10, 10 per thousand when the spring growth begins and again in September. So they give you what to do by taking a soil test. So now if you did not take a soil test, you're shooting blindly 
and may come up deficient on your, uh, your requirements of your soil. Now, uh, let's assume this is Bermuda grass. I would follow that recommendation pretty much to the T and says, I've got it. So just move on in that fashion. Then it says, if you're collecting clippings, you're gonna have to add more. They can give you that advice. And so I never recommend collecting clippings. If you've got a more to collect clippings and you're collecting them, I wonder what you do with them. Leave them on the ground and you put your potassium, phosphorus, and your amino acids back on the ground. And amino acids ultimately goes to organic nitrogen, which is converted to usable nitrogen. So try not to take your clippings off. That's waste going to the landfill. And if you're taking the clippings off and putting them around your shrub, you're utilizing them but you make around the shrub may be out of balance now for nutrients as well. Leave them on the grass. That's the best place for them. That's where they came from. Put them back in there. And by the way, the, the clippings do not add a thatch uh, in this area because the temperature rises, microbes will break down the clippings. And it really doesn't remember uh, thatch is nothing but uh, non-broken down uh, stems as well as leaves. So they'll eventually break down for you. Now let's take establishing a fescue lawn. If you've got a brand new area that you want to establish fescue for the first time, this is fescue that you see in this picture. Number one thing you're going to do is soil test. The second thing you're going to do is identify a three-way seed blend. Do not buy fescue with ryegrass. If you're trying to establish fescue, buy fescue. Buy a three-way blend, a three-way blend uh, if one is weak, the other one is strong, it makes up and balance out. It's, rather, it's best to have a three-way blend setting in your lawn. Next year, if you oversee, again, put a three-way blend. Leave off the, uh, uh, the annual rye, the perennial rye, the, uh, some of the other rye grasses, because once spring arrives, then the rye grass will die, creating disease issues for your fescue. So again, it's a cheaper grass, and you buy it and there's no reason to have it. The fourth thing you're gonna do is apply eight to nine pounds of 10, 10, 10 per thousand square feet. Go back to the university recommendation. That's their recommendation that they were making to you, eight to nine pounds per thousand. They were recommending 10 pounds and I did it blindly without having a soil test. The fifth thing you're gonna do is seed at the rate of eight to nine pounds of seed per thousand square foot. Do not put on 12, do not put on 15. Remember, fescue is a clumping grass. Leave room for the grass to grow because it starts off as an individual seed and it clumps in and all the clumps reaches together as you see in the picture in the background. And then um, water that lawn every, uh, twice a day for about five days or three times a day, morning, noon, and night. How much water did I put? Lightly, lightly, lightly. Just moist the top is all you're trying to do. Moist the top, turn the water off. Noon, moist the top, turn the water off. In the evening, moist it, turn the water off. If you're working and not at home, put a little bit more water in the morning before you leave for work. And then as soon as you get home, a little more water, just do it twice a day. In five days, the grass will come up. 10 days, you'll have a green lawn. Now you'll mow it two inches in the, after two weeks. Leave it alone for two weeks or you'll pull the seed out of the ground, mow it two inches, and, and you can bring that height of cut up in the spring to three to four inches. But in the, in the fall, leave it at two inches for best look of the turf. Now, what do I need? Here is a, uh, a picture of a fertilizer spreader. It's probably bigger than most of you would use. It could be a smaller one or you can buy one just like that one but you're gonna soil test. You're gonna use the spreader and spread the fertilizer. That fertilizer has a pre-emergence herbicide on it. I'm gonna talk about that in just in a moment. Then the pre-emergence herbicide, some have a post-emergence herbicide. I do not recommend post-emergence herbicide only because you need a wet leaf surface. If I've got a high K, then I have spotted turf from the high K. So planning and preparation equals success. Now, if you go to the right, there are two fertilizer uh, labels there. One has a pre-emergence. And if you look in the top part, it's an active ingredient called prodiamine. That's how you know it's a pre-emergence. And that one is a 8024, this high uh, potassium, a little bit of nitrogen. You normally cannot buy that at, uh, at the big box stores, but try to buy one similar. 
if you can buy an 8012 or 8014 or something, you can do it, or you can buy a 0020. Potassium is a key element. The only reason I put nitrogen in with it, it helps to metabolize and take up the potassium within the plant. The top one is 18460. That's the most concentrated form of phosphate you can have. You generally will not find that one, but all, all fertilizers taken off that one. So if you find a uh, uh, 9230, or if you find a 41200, um, you're doing the same thing, but it's cut for spreadability. 1846 is very important. And I generally recommend in the spring, 1846 is a great product, particularly if you're phosphorus deficient. But you generally can't, but those numbers are important to remember. By combining the two, you would take 50% called 923 plus a four, so you'd be 13, 23, 12, if you just combine those two products together. Now that's a little bit beyond maybe what you need to know, but you can look at those numbers when you go buy your fertilizer. Um, now, this is fescue on the left side, it was September 16th, that land was prepared to seed fescue on the right side. And believe it or not, that's a flashlight in the evening. And uh, it's a beautiful sky in the back. That sky did not look like that, but somehow the flashlight and the camera made it look well. But in five days, you can see the fescue coming up. It's also coming up on the edges. The light just didn't pick it up. So in seven days, you have a green light, 10 days, uh, in fact, I looked at it yesterday, that's a solid green today. So in a couple of weeks, I would mow that uh, at two inch height. Now it would be a lot higher than that. In uh, two weeks, that's probably gonna be three or four inches. It's gonna look a little ragged and just mow it off and then start looking nice for you. Now let's talk about newly seeded versus overseeded. This is a little complicated slide. As Josh indicated, you can pull this presentation up and pull these down for yourself a little bit later. But on the newly seeded, it's eight to nine pounds of seed per thousand. If it's overseeded, do not put any more than five to seven pounds of seed per thousand. The amount of phosphorus you need, and remember we talked about how to calculate phosphorus, a half a pound of nit I mean, nitrogen, a half a pound of nitrogen per thousand, both on overseeded and newly seeded. A one pound of phosphorus is I prefer per thousand, and that's for the immediate need of that turf. And then 1.25 pounds of potassium per thousand. And then you have to till or create on the newly seeded, create a soil contact. That seed must have contact with the soil, not contact with thatch or uh, underneath the turf. It must have contact with uh, soil. Same is true with the overseeded. So I recommend air frying before seeding that creates enough uh, soil that the seed can come in contact, sprout and grow. Without the soil contact, again, you wasted your money on the seed. And seed, by the way, this year is very expensive only because it's a drought in the Pacific Northwest uh, and therefore the seed is in a shortage supply at this time. Uh, drag chain across the surface of newly seeded or you can use Whatever method you have, you can turn a rake, a lawn rake upside down, leaf rake, and drag it across, and that's enough to create the contact with the soil. Uh, but you can do the same thing, just drag a chain across on overseeded turf after uh, you seed it, that drops the seed below that turf layer down into where the airification holes are. And then water twice per day for five days. If you can do it three times, it's better. Lightly water, lightly water, lightly water and then uh, move on. Normal watering on overseeded because you have the turf to protect the dryness of the soil. So just normal water and you're taken care of. Water once a week, once you establish until it really gets well, and then uh, just regular water schedules on the overseeding. So again, don't waste the water. I'm high encouraging to manage the water and plan your program. Mow two weeks after uh, seeding and then mow on a regular basis on overseeding. That's it. See, fescue is easy to grow. Uh, just do it right, and you'll have a fescue for quite a while. Then next year, if it thins out in September, air fry it, overseed it. Don't till it up again. Just keep overseeding every year, once a year. Enjoy the grass. Again, uh, fescue for uh, 10 months. You've got 10 months of green out of 12. 
Now, if you manage it right with the right fungicide, you can have 12 out of 12. That's why commercial property gets it. But mow the grass as high as you can get in the spring. Uh, once April gets here, bring that height of cut to three. If you can get it to four, most of you can't. But if you can get it to four, it's better. A three-inch cut is most ideal for fescue. The reason for it, it shades the surface, doesn't dry out as fast, and prevents many of the diseases. Now, do I adjust my pH? If that soil sample says adjust the pH, adjust the pH. Uh, follow the soil test. If it doesn't say to adjust the pH, don't buy the lime, don't adjust the pH. pH adjustments are the same for your yard or it is for a golf course or it is for an agronomic uh, crops such as tomatoes, potatoes, you must adjust the pH or blueberries, you got to adjust the pH. And so you can have a great lawn by adjusting pH, you can have do the same thing I told you what to do. Uh, with the lousy pH, you're going to have a lousy lawn. So you're going to end up with diseases, a lot of insect issues, brown out, dry out, and the turf is not going to have a good root system. Now, when is the ideal time to plant fescue? You want to plant fescue it's between September 15th to November 1, preferably September 15th to October 15th. If you see fescue in January, it's not likely to make it beyond May because the roots have not established. Once the soil gets hot, the fescue will die. So if you miss that window of, of seeding, you might want to struggle along with some other type of grass in the following year. Again, September to October 15th, you can go up to November 15th, particularly in this area, just get it up very quickly, allow the roots to establish, put the right fertilizer on it, and you will have a great grass. Beyond that, uh, I'm not going to wish you uh, the best because you're probably not likely to have a great lawn if you wait until December, January to seed it. Uh, now, the pre-emergence herbicides I can use on my lawn, this is going to be true for all the grasses we're going to talk about today. And if you miss the name spelling, you can pull this uh, website up again and, and pull it up. But the three I recommend is, and there are a couple others, but uh, Prodiamine, uh, Dithiapyr, and then Penimethylin. You'll see Penimethylin readily available in the market. You must use two applications of Penimethylin. If you use Dithiapyr, you must use two applications of Dithiapyr. Prodiamine, a single application, even though the bag is set up for two, in many cases, you can just double that rate and set it up and do one application. Uh, the ones you have issues with is penimethylin. It stains, it's a very yellowing, it stains and will penetrate the concrete. Prodiamine is yellow, but it's non-staining because it's non-soluble in water. Uh, the active ingredients listed on the bag, the percent active. I'm not gonna give you a recommendation because they're gonna vary by the bag. Follow their recommendation on the bag for your thousand square foot recommendations. Uh, for example, prodiamine could be 0.25, it could be 0.5 or it could be 0.37. That rate depends on their spread rate they're recommending on the bag. So again, follow their label and stay with it as much as possible. Now, if I over apply uh, dithiapyr, or penimethylin, or prodiamine, would that affect my lawn? Not if you do not exceed 25%, but when you start getting into the 50% rate, you can because you can uh, inhibit the root development of the plant. Prodiamine is the least soluble of all. It cannot get in the roots of, of the plant. So if you're going to over apply any, prodiamine is when you want to do it. But according to the label, you should not over apply any of them. And when to apply that? Good point. Let's talk about uh, fescue. Fescue, if I do newly seeded fescue, I do not want to put a pre-emergence on until after the second mowing, after the second mowing. The only thing I will be after on uh, fescue in the fall would be POA or annual bluegrass and some of the winter annuals. Uh, now the ideal time for fescue, since we just talked about it, is February, or early March, preferably February, because crabgrass begins to germinate in mid-March or 1st of April. So you've got to get it on before the crabgrass germinate. The other problem is, if I go too late in the fall, poa annual, annual bluegrass germinates uh, beginning in September. And if you're putting on the product in December, waiting for after the second mowing of fescue, 
you could already have some annual bluegrass germinating. But annual bluegrass does not show up in fescue as bad as it does in dormant Bermuda. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. I plan on spring applications of, of the uh, pre-emergence, which is a great point. Too late. And again, you wasted uh, uh, your money. The idea is to plan anything, whether you're planning to grow tomatoes or whether you're planning to grow turf. That plan creates great turf and less headaches. Okay, how do I determine which fertilizer to buy? I need phosphorus, I need potassium, I need nitrogen. It's hard for me in this setting to make a recommendation uh, on a good fertilizer. The one I just put on the, uh, the slide there, 1238, you'll see that a lot. You can buy 10, 10, 10, but when you buy a pre-emergence, you're generally buying it with a fertilizer set blend. You're not buying pre-emergence on a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer. So be careful what you buy. Look at the N, P, and K. N being the first number, P being the second, K. Nitrogen to potassium is very important. So if you can get nitrogen potassium close, like a 12 potassium and a 12 nitrogen, that's most ideal because the efficiency of both nutrients work together. Phosphorus, on the other hand, works by itself. Phosphorus is very important. It's very important on respiration of the plant, very important on the root development of the plant, and most important, it's on the chlorophyll development, and that creates dark turf, so nitrogen with the phosphorus. If you put a 12-3-8, you're not putting enough phosphorus. I would yield to a product with a 12, something higher, and then a, uh, closer to a 12 on the potassium. Shop your fertilizer. It's the only thing I'm going to encourage you, and generally, you've you can ask somebody in the store, unless you've got a specialty shop, most cannot tell you, just do a little bit of homework. And I'm sure my assistants behind will give you a bulletin that you can go to and UGA give you some advice on that as well. Okay, the next is Bermuda grass. Let's go to Bermuda grass. It's green for seven to eight months and you cannot get, get it any greener. Now, you, there are dyes that you can use to spray Bermuda grass and better ones today than there were yesterday. So you can spray it, but I would professionally spray it for better uniform coverage if you want green dyed grass, so you can do it. But Bermuda grass requires less water than fescue, which is a benefit, has less diseases, and you has a, a mowing issues. For example, you can scalp Bermuda grass. You've got uneven turf. It's hard to scalp fescue. Fescue stays green for the most part when you mow it. So Bermuda grass, you can scalp it, then you have to wait for it to grow back out again. The grow back, but it will recover. The grow back and recovery is short or long, depends how much you scalped it, but that's a negative. So the point I make is try to even your lawn out with sand, buy a bag of sand and take and rake it in to level it out. But it also requires sunlight to grow. It requires more sunlight than fescue. If you have grass, it's uh, now no longer grass underneath the tree. You either trim the tree, take out the tree, or spread the um, bed around the tree larger and grow less grass underneath the tree. You must have a minimum of eight hours for good uh, for Bermuda grass growth. So you cannot get around it at all. Bermuda grass, a nutrient program, it requires for a year, four to five pounds of nitrogen per year, two pounds of phosphorus. Now these are per thousand square feet. Again, a 50 by 20 is a thousand square feet. And I think my assistants probably sent out a bulletin on the fertilizer, I mean, the calculation per thousand square feet. And then two pounds of actual phosphorus and then four pounds of actual K per thousand. That's what it requires per year. Do I put that all up front or do it two applications or three ap applications? Up to you. But if you're using soluble, nitrogen, I recommend two applications or three applications because nitrogen does leach out of the soil. You can go to controlled release, as you see at the bottom, sulfur-coated urea or poly-coated urea or product called nitroform. Nitroform is very hard to find. Professional turf like golf courses use a lot of it, but you can't hardly find that, but you'll find it in blends of fertilizer, but generally not available straight nitroform. Uh, but you can buy sulfur-coated urea to extend the life of nitrogen or poly-coated urea, which is a polymer coating around to protect the nitrogen from leaching and puts it on a time scale. 
uh, Bermudagrass, um, you can buy this time of the year, but put it out between now and October 15th. Pre-emergence on a 0020. You can buy that at your uh, uh, any stores for, uh, for the fall. There are some people that promotes different than that. Some of the other fertilizers are away from Bermuda grass. You do not need the nitrogen. Bermuda grass is going dormant, but you need the potassium. So uh, 0020 with a pre-emerge and select any of the pre-emerge I gave you, uh, dithiapyr, prodiamine, or uh, pentamethylin, as it's listed at the bottom. Also controls POA, henbit, shepherd's purse, and dust controls some other uh, winter annual, since it's best to get them out of, of your lawn. It's better to see dormant Bermuda than dormant Bermuda grass with weeds and poa. Uh, that's the grass that comes up in the fall, and it's better to get that out before it germinates. Um, and to take out the broadleaf weeds that's not controlled by the pre-emergence, you can use the three-way blend. Those three-way blends contain the active ingredient dicamba, 2,4-D, and MCPP. They contain it right in the container. You can look on the container on the label and active ingredients very clearly states it. And uh, generally, if you're using the right uh, three-way, it's like a, a one and a half ounce per gallon of water per thousand square feet. But re again, read your label because some of the concentrations are less than uh, fully concentrated. Other products that you may wanna jot down to use if you've got certain things in your grass, uh, Bermuda grass, such as uh, uh, wild violets, uh, which is a problem for some people. Another one is Veronica. I wrote it down for I wouldn't forget it. Speedwell, which is a real problem. You can use Quinclorac, Metsulfuron, Methyl, Glyphosate on dormant Bermuda grass, but make sure that Bermuda grass is dormant. Amazapir and Sulfuron, you can use them, but read and follow those labels. There are others, but I recommend uh, the top three is probably will solve most of your issues. Uh, replacing Bermuda grass. I've got an area I want to replace Bermuda grass, which do I put out? There's some new Bermuda grass that's more shade tolerant. It still requires sunlight, but it requires less sunlight. So just be careful there. But the new one out there is tip tough. You got celebration. They're darker green, more uniform, the healthier turf. And then you have the TIF 419, which is the common Bermuda grass for most people. It's not a common Bermuda, but it's more common uh, type of Bermuda. But look for the newer types like TIF Tough and Celebration. Can I blend TIF Tough and Celebration in my 419 turf? You can, but it will stand out like a sore thumb. So you can round up twice with Bermuda grass and then lay out TIF turf for Celebration and you'll be happier with it. Uh, choose a new variety of Bermuda grass that's greener and toler tolerates less sunlight. That's the only thing I'm going to suggest to you. Uh, now let's go to zoysia grass to stay with our time here. This slide I pulled from uh, True Green. They did a great job on it. It's uh, Marvel, Myers, El Toro, and uh, uh, Zeon. I generally recommend Meyer. You can see the color. I don't recommend El Toro. A lot of people do. It's cheaper generally. Myers or Xeon is my best preference on uh, zoysia because of the green turf and requires less fertility. And uh, also they require less water. Zoysia requires more water than any of the grass we're going to talk about today. Zoysia lawn, uh, it's the highest water use. Spring disease issue, to avoid spring disease issue, my only suggestion to you is raise height of cut in the fall. October, get the height of cut up. I know you hate to do that. Raise the height of cut and you avoid the, the disease issue called spring dead spot in the spring. Spring dead spot's tough to control because that, did, the, that disease occurred in September and October of this year, but you do not see the problem until uh, when the zoysia comes out of dormancy like April. That's very unfortunate. Now, can I spray in the fall? Yes, you can. I suggest you get a lawn care company on that. They'll spray, and they should do two applications, September, 30 days later in October, then you will not have spring dead spot if you want to keep the zoysia cut short. Raise height of cut, first of October, like now, and you'll avoid that disease. Amazing, you avoid the, have a big money saver as well. Seven, eight month of green grass with zoysia, you like it because 
we like the way it plays, but it does require a lot more water. More fertilizer use is also on zoysia, but less sunlight is required than Bermuda grass, but it does have a nice green texture and you do not get the scalping only because zoysia grows down deeper in the grass with the green chlorophyll. Uh, zoysia grass, uh, I can use 0020 pre-emergence, the same pre-emergence, put it out now because you do not want uh, the POA to germinate. Three-way herbicide you can use on zoysia, it's not a problem. Spring fertilizer at 12-4-24 with pre-emergence, put that out in January, February on zoysia. You do not need to wait to March, so if you've got time in January, February, go ahead and put it out. And I can use a three-way herbicide in October, I mean in uh, April and May to knock out annual broadleaf weeds. In a summer, summer fertilizer, I recommend like a 24-0-0, make two applications 30, 45 days apart. And you'll have a beautiful zoysia grass all year. Uh, Bahia grass, um, <laughs> in my days of dealing with turf, I generally call it the poor man's grass, but if it's done right, most people enjoy Bahia grass. But remember, I'll tell you this up front, keep phosphate and 2,4-D off of Bahia. Bahia does not like either one of those ingredients. And uh, to control Bahia and Bermuda grass, if I get Bahia and Bermuda grass, use methsulfuron methyl. Look for that active ingredient, spray it across. It does not hurt the Bermuda grass, but it will kill Bahia. Now on the right side of the picture, you'll see the roots from Bahia. Just pull it up. That's what you'll see. It's tough to control but it does not require much water and it's pretty drought tolerant grass. Bahia, and uh, it's a very Southern low maintenance, requires two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square foot, two pounds of potassium per thousand square foot. You can put it out once, you can put it out twice. I would prefer twice and then mow two or three times, uh, two to three inches all season long, prefer height. That's not mow two or three times, mow two to three inches and water only when it's showing stress. That's a very low maintenance water turf. So we've got a long, a large turf and the long season and you want a nice looking lawn, uh, there's nothing wrong with Bahia. It works, but 2,4-D, do not put 2,4-D on that grass. It will damage the grass. Now let's talk about another one I personally like. A lot of people do not because it takes a long time to establish centipede. But the grass you see in the front is centipede. It's an alternative to Bermuda. And a wonderful part about centipede, it does not scalp out like Bermuda grass. It's tough to start, very tough to start, but it's easy to establish. It creates by runners and then uh, it does not scalp and it will grow beautifully once you get established. But if you wanna maintain the shrub, uh, shrubbery and flower beds, be careful that grass will grow very aggressively in your shrubs and flower beds. Pre-emergence, same as Bermuda. So do a 0020 with potassium and a uh, pre-emergence between September and October. Uh, no 2,4-D herbicide on that grass as well. And then urea, uh, two pounds of urea per thousand early in the spring, put it all out early in the spring or put it out in two applications. That's all you need to do all summer long then mow two to two and a half inch cut and you'll enjoy that grass. It's a beautiful grass. Uh, just keep the bahia out of it and, uh, and then keep the broad leaves out and you can enjoy it. Most people don't like it's too aggressive once it is established. Seashore paspellum. I'm gonna bring that one to you only for one reason, because the new Atlanta uh, baseball field is seashore paspellum. You're gonna go there. You're gonna wonder what type of grass is. It's a beautiful grass. It's new to this area. I just made a recommendation on the ball field this week or last week on seashore pass spelling for the infield. It's easy to maintain. It started in Florida in the United States because you can water out of the ocean, water with salt water, water with bad water, and it very easy can wipe out uh, a broadleaf weeds by just using salt water to wipe out a lot of broadleaf weeds. It requires low fertilizer, low fertilizer rates. And there is one I would recommend a uh, slow release fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer base, like a uh, poly coated or nitroform. If you're gonna look at it, go all the way and look for the best nitrogen. Uh, just wait for about two years, my suggestion. If, you, if you're considering, if you go to the Braves game, 
wait for two years, let it uh, get more established, and then look at it. It's very expensive. You can buy it by the pallet. And I think a pallet of uh, seashore pastellum is about $520. And uh, a pallet is 500 square feet, by the way. Now let's review what I just told you. When growing turf, you got to manage the sunlight. What you see in the picture here, that's managed sunlight. The trees are cut high. That is Bermuda grass. And so you can manage the sunlight. You can get eight hours of sunlight. You can grow Bermuda grass with the right fertility. Manage the water. Uh, don't overwater Bermuda grass. Don't overwater fescue. And then, um, and then mow it at the right height. And most importantly, keep the fertility right. Turf adds a natural beauty of home, sports turf, golf course, highways, and even airport. I put that airport picture in there for a reason. I worked with O'Hare Airport to establish grass. It goes back about 12 years ago. They needed to cool the concrete because hot concrete takes longer to get an aircraft off the ground. <clears throat> so cool turf along concrete makes it ideal. Now that is same is true with you. If you look at the picture on that uh, turf, there's the uh, walkway. It's hotter within two feet of that walkway than out into the turf. Therefore, crabgrass will germinate faster in that area. Broadleaf weeds will join, germinate faster in that area. And so it creates a hot surface. On an airport, they like to cool that surface down. So that's why you see a lot of grass. I mean, maybe weeds and grass, but they try to go for pure grass because it's also is a filtration. Remember, they've got to control that water is off that runway. Remember what we said, one inch of water, 625 gallons of water per thousand. Now let's deal with the Metro Atlanta. This is interesting fact you can use over dinner one night. Within the Atlanta metro area, there are approximately 250,000 uh, uh, acres or 900 and I mean, 390 square miles of maintained turf, or what we call managed turf. And this lawn in front of me, that's what you call managed turf. And uh, commercial turf is managed turf, lawn care that's managed turf. It does not include the weedy areas. So it does require enough oxygen to provide 16 million people just the 250,000 acres of managed turf. It's a big crop. It is a crop. And if you manage it properly, it is providing oxygen for all of us. Uh, but I'm going to thank you for your attendance and checking in today. But as the slide uh, said at the top, it's your turn. So you can ask us questions. I have two assistants in the back. They probably have better answers than I'm going to have. But you can ask, uh, come in and, and ask us questions, and we can provide, hopefully, an answer for you. Thank you, Ron. I've uh, made it to where everyone can unmute themselves if they have an answer uh, there was, or a question rather. Uh, the, uh, there was a question earlier, Ron, about uh, basically what is a water column? Could you talk a little bit more about, um, I've provided a link in the chat, but uh, talk a little bit more about water table or water column uh, when you're talking irrigation. Sure, a water column, if you take a column of soil, let's say, uh, let's say if you took a core sample and it was uh, three inches in diameter and take a core sample of six inches, lift that core sample, that water column is how much water is or are the colloids of that soil holding? Will it from the top to the bottom? So the, the water column says from evaporation and transpiration all day long, I lose water into the air. So I lose water out of that water column through adhesion. So all of the water molecules are connected together and they're pulled up as they evaporate off the surface. The next one pulls up and evaporates. So it keeps pulling the water up. And so if I've got water down, say two inches and I water in the top one eighth of an inch, tomorrow I will have an evaporation of one eighth of water and I've not pulled the water column up to the top. At nighttime, that water column is pulled up to the surface because the surface is cooler. But if it's not adequate water, it will not come back to the surface. That's what creates uh, irrigation to try to connect the water column. Hopefully that makes more sense.
Any Thanks, others? Ron, I think that's about all we had from the chat. Um, George asked about the recording, and we will be providing a link to the recording mm -hmm. after the fact. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, at this point, then we'll end the session and you can go back and pull the recording up as he indicated, or you can send a letter or a question back to uh, ask a master gardener. We can try to answer it again. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. We had like four.